When it comes to RF power splitter combiners, if you want an implementation that presents both a wide bandwidth as well as no theoretical losses, you will usually need a transformer. Hello and welcome back. Today I want to continue talking about splitter combiners by looking at two transformer based structures, a 0 degrees and an 180 degrees splitters. These circuits are usually built from quite a few components, so to better understand how the splitters work, let's build them up one component at a time to clearly see what each one does. Let's start off with the 0 degrees circuit. On the surface, this starts life off as a T-junction. It has similar properties. So if we simulate, we can see the 50 ohms being ideally matched to 200 ohm outputs. So the input port impedance is half that of the outputs. And if we check the two outputs, we can see a zero degrees phase shift. So this is a zero degrees splitter. And well, as long as you ignore the parasitics and work with ideal components, the signal splitting seems to be frequency independent. So it's perfectly flat over the complete simulated range. Now, this design does contain a transformer, which could cause problems. But since the currents running through the transformer are going in opposing directions, the magnetic fields will cancel out. That is why the frequency range seems to be so wide. If we now check the isolation, using a setup in which we inject signal into one of the branches and then check the other side, we again are getting a similar behavior to the T-junction. We are seeing a signal of minus 6 dB. But this is where the similarities end, because while we are getting the same signal amplitude, this time we are seeing a phase shift of 180 degrees. The signal on the other side of the splitter is in phase opposition. And this is something to keep in mind, because usually when you see this type of splitter in real life, there will always be an extra component which is taking advantage of this phase shift. So in most cases, the zero degrees transformer splitter has an extra resistor in between the output terminals. And the resistor is equal to double that of the output ports. So in this case, 200 ohms is double of 100. While this does not impact normal operation, when normal signal is injected, there is no signal passing between the two zero degrees branches. But when it comes to the isolation test, the addition of this resistor greatly improves the response. We are getting a higher and higher isolation level as frequency increases. And this is what makes this circuit so important. It can present a very wide bandwidth, but it can also work with good isolation levels. It's just that pesky input impedance which is problematic. So at the moment, the input impedance is half that of the output ports. Now fixing this can be done using another transformer, a 2 to 1 impedance converter. So this can be used to take the 50 ohms input down to 25. And then after passing it through the second transformer, you should get double, so 50 again. And while the resistor on the output is maintained to get the same isolation characteristics. So if we check this circuit, we can see the input signal at 0 dB, so it's half that of our level 2 signal, the input is matched to the circuit, and then on the output we see two signals both at 0 degrees at minus 3 dBs, so half that of what is being injected. Now in practice the transformers used are not ideal. This is especially problematic on the impedance converter side. So if we recheck our circuit, but using a 99.9% .9 coupling factor, and we look at the output, we can see a high frequency corner appearing in the design. After a certain point, the output attenuation starts to vary. And well, we get a similar story on the input side. The signal source is no longer matched to the circuit. So one less trick can be used, which is the addition of an extra capacitor. This should compensate the uncoupled inductance to extend the bandwidth a bit. So if we relook at the output, while this does not solve the issues completely, 
it does help to extend the response a bit longer. So we have a flat response on the output for a few extra tens of megahertz. And well, if we look on the input and again compare the two circuits, while not ideal, it still brings the input response closer to ideal for a bit longer. So this is the shape in which you will find the zero degree splitter in most cases, with two different transformers, one responsible for impedance transformation and the other for the actual signal splitting. When it comes to this specific circuit, I thought about building one to test it out, but then took apart some of the things I had lying around and discovered I already had a few of these splitters to begin with. They were not made for 50 ohms, but the adaptation should not be that difficult. The main circuit change being the isolation resistor value. So one of the things that I found was that the common TV signal splitter, which is built to operate over a very wide bandwidth, like this one is rated from 5 to 1000 megahertz, is built using the principles that we've just discussed. The initial transformer is an impedance converter, stepping down the 75 ohms to half, and then you have another transformer to split the signal into two equal values. And there are a few more components in here, like this compensation capacitor, as well as some DC blocking capacitors, and of course the resistor in between the outputs. The layout does seem a bit complicated, but I guess this was done to improve the higher frequency operation, so if you modify this to work on 50 ohms, or some other value, then the bandwidth might be slightly reduced. Now, initially, I wanted to state that there is not a lot of point in building such a circuit yourself, because these TV splitters are quite cheap. So it's easier to just buy one and repurpose it. But when your goal is to buy cheap, well, you get what you paid for. So I went and bought about six of these splitters for a grand total of roughly $6. These were not bought from a Chinese website, but rather the local resellers who provide their own commercial add-ons. And well, on the outside, these all look okay. However, if we do look inside, well, we'll see that some corners have been cut. I mean, for these two, they use the splitter transformer and the PCB, but not much else. And well, for the free output versions, the signal values will not be the same. Anyway, with these, it gets even better since they skip the PCB completely. And I have to say, I really like the way they did the four output separation. This is just brilliant engineering. Leaving cheap designs aside, you can still buy proper zero degree signal splitters, which could be repurposed. But unless you're buying from a reputable brand, you never know what you're gonna get. Especially if the product is suspiciously cheap. The other common transformer based power splitter is the 180 degree splitter. Named so because the two outputs are 180 degrees phase shifted. While this can be built in more than one way, the implementation I want to focus on today uses a single transformer. So when you build a two winding transformer, the signal present at the output terminals is 180 degrees phase shifted to begin with. Now, if you add equal value loads on the outputs, as well as a signal source of the same impedance, you can create a match system if the transformer impedance ratio is one to two. So in this case, my signal source is providing a signal at zero dBs, half that of the AC2 signal. And then on the two outputs, we are seeing two minus three dB signals. So with this circuit, we are getting the basic prototype of a 180 degrees signal splitter with all ports having equal impedance. But this does have one major issue though. If something were to happen to any of the loads, like it's left unconnected, the circuit will not work at all. So the first thing to do is to connect the midpoint of the secondary side of the transformer to ground. The signal present on the outputs of the transformer is exactly the same as before, it's just that the middle of the transformer is now hard connected to ground. 
And as long as the loads are matched, we can check and see that there's absolutely no current running through this midpoint. So this connection is not really impacting the normal operation of the circuit. Anyway, if we now go to the isolation test and we look at the secondary branch, we will see a familiar sight, the minus 6 dB value, indicating that there is room for improvement. So we can fix this by providing a load for the unwanted current to go to, but unlike the previous circuit, we can just put a resistor in between the terminals, since there isn't a 180 degree signal there under normal conditions, so that would be wasteful, and it wouldn't really work either, so in this case, the way you gain isolation is by adding the resistor in the common ground connection that we've previously created. And the resistor value needs to be half of the output impedances. So by using this resistor, if we check the other side of the circuit, we can see the ever increasing amount of isolation provided by the transformer. So this is very similar in behavior to the zero degree splitter. While the splitter combiner can be used in multiple circuits, I do want to highlight an application in which the isolation is especially important. So one use case is the mixing of a local oscillator with multiple input signals at the same time, like when you have an antenna array. So long story short, if you have two antennas and you wish to downconvert the input signal to an intermediate frequency, but keep the signal phase relationship the same, you will use the same local oscillator. So a block diagram for such a circuit will also contain a low pass filter and the final practical build will probably have some input amplifiers as well. Anyway, the place where we need our splitter is right here in the middle, where the local oscillator signal gets distributed to the two mixers. So the intended flow of signals in such a circuit is from left to right and from the oscillator to the mixers. What is not intended, however, is signal flow from one mixer to the other. So to illustrate this example and what could go wrong, I built a simplified version of the circuit where I used signal sources both for the useful signal as well as for the local oscillator. And well, as mixers, I used the most bog standard single diode type mixer with a bit of bias. It's not great, but it works. So the input signals are 10 and 10.1 megahertz, and the local oscillator is nine megahertz. And in an ideal world, the first output should contain the difference of the two. So 10 minus nine is one megahertz, while the second output should contain the difference between the other two, 10.1 minus nine being 1.1 megahertz. So if we run the circuit, we check our output signal, and we run an FFT on it, and we just zoom in a bit, well, we get both the one megahertz as well as the 1.1 megahertz signal. And interestingly, they appear to be the same amplitude. And well, other than these, we are getting all sorts of other things, like the difference between the two signals and a bunch of harmonics. Now, if we quickly look at our circuit again, this does make sense since there's absolutely no isolation in between the mixers. Through the coupling capacitors, everything is interconnected into a single node. So that's why it's behaving the way it is. Now, if we start off with a zero degree splitter built just with the transformer and leave everything else the same, and we check the output, again using the FFT, we can see that things are beginning to improve. So rather than having the two equal value signals, now the one megahertz signal is clearly larger than the 1.1 megahertz signal. This is to be expected since the transformer offered a bit of isolation, but this is nowhere near sufficient to make the circuit usable. Now, if we modify the circuit one final time and also include the isolation resistor and compare this output, to the circuit without the resistor, so output two and output three, this time we see a significant improvement in the intended signals. There is now a clear attenuation between the intended signal at one megahertz 
and the not intended one at 1.1 MHz. So you can use this sort of mixer topology, but you just need to take care in isolating the two signal streams. If you're considering building any of the circuits mentioned today, it's important to remember how the transformers actually need to be built to get the right ratios. While it's common to talk about transformers in terms of turns ratio, when you're discussing impedance ratio, it's important to remember that it's not the same thing. So for the circuits analyzed today, we used three different transformers, two for the zero degree splitter and one for the 180 degrees one. Before running some numbers, let's remember the main characteristics of a standard two winding transformer. In a simplified ideal case, the voltage ratios are equal to the inverse of the current ratios and equal to the turns ratio. But this in turn is equal to the square of the inductance ratio. And if we're talking about impedances, then the equation is equal to the impedance squares. In other words, the impedance ratio is equal to the square root of the turns ratio. So an impedance ratio of 2 means a turns ratio of square root of 2. You will never be able to get this exact value though in practice. So you need some ratios which are close enough. Practically used examples are 5 and 7 and 12 and 17. These will give close values. Now you can always multiply these by some integer, say use 10 and 14 turns or 24 and 34 turns. But the point is that if you really want an impedance ratio of 2, then you will only be able to get close, but not have that value exactly. Anyway, if we now come back to the transformers with T2, it's simple. Both sides of the winding need to have the same number of turns. The exact value will depend on the inductance that you need. For T1, it gets a bit more complicated since you need the ratio between the total number of turns and the bottom bit to be the square root of 2. So here a common set of values is either 2 and 5 or 5 and 12 or well, some multiple of these. And finally for T3, we need to respect two conditions. First, the total number of turns of the secondary to primary needs to be the square root of 2. But the second condition is that the secondary side needs to be built from two windings having an equal number of turns. So the total number needs to be an even number. Like not 7 or 17. Practical values being 10, 7, 7 or 24, 17, 17. If we now check the first transformer we found in the TV splitter, we can indeed count the turns. It's 5 turns of one color and 2 of the other. So they are using the 5 to 7 ratio for the first impedance transformer. The color change is occurring in the coil split. And to highlight an example for the second type of transformer, what I have here is a transformer with a split winding on the secondary, which has an impedance ratio of 2. So this thing has 10 turns on one side, the yellow wire, and 14 with a split on the second side, the green wire. So this transformer is built with 5 plus 7 turns times 2. In the end, transformer-based signal or power splitters are a widely used tool, but care must be taken when constructing these. You can achieve very wide bandwidths, but only if the parasitics are minimized. And on the topic of isolation, usually more is better, but more may not be sufficient. So that topic also needs to be kept in mind. And with that said, hope you enjoyed this video. And if so, there are more similar videos on my channel that you might want to check out. And if you want to be up to date with my latest releases, also consider subscribing. See you next time. Bye bye.